Mathematica Academy. Uh, it is my great honor to open the second lecture about Poland, uh, dedicated especially to you, uh, diplomats and foreigners who live in Poland and uh, are willing to learn more about our history and uh, heritage. So the project uh, that we are having here is an effect of uh, collaboration uh, between the MFA, Diplomatic Academy, and the Institute de Republica. So I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Andrzej Przyłemski, who is a director of the Institute de Republica and also a Polish former ambassador to Germany. So, um, our guest speaker today is Professor Przemysław Żurawski Belgrajewski, a, a great political scientist from the University of Łódź, uh, advisor to the foreign minister and a member of the National Development Council, which is an uh, advisory body to uh, in the president's office. So um, I could go on and on here as uh, professor's uh, CV is uh, quite uh, rich, but uh, I'm sure you cannot wait for, uh, for his remarks. So uh, um, the title of the lecture today is uh, Poland and Ukraine, a tactical alliance or strategic partnership. Uh, so it might be a little bit um, thought-provoking title, um, but um, I hope it will be uh, it will be interesting for you. So, um, Mr. Professor, uh, thank you for accepting uh, our invitation, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I feel honored and privileged to have such an opportunity to uh, address uh, such a distinguished audience uh, and to share with you uh, a couple of remarks uh, concerning Polish-Ukrainian relations, which for obvious reasons, uh, for the fact that uh, we are neighbors since the beginning of our history, uh, in fact uh, deserves uh, entire set of lectures and not just an hour and a half. Uh, so I feel forced to uh, resign basically uh, from any attempt to describe history in details, but uh, we cannot avoid it completely. Uh, I will try to present that dimension of Polish-Ukrainian relations uh, in some symbolic way. Uh, I think that uh, due to the uh, Hollywood impact on the international imagination, uh, it would be good to uh, give you the symbols uh, taken from uh, American history because it's uh, well known and in such the uh, mixed audience I cannot just pick up the national history of any of your country. Uh, so, uh, shortly speaking about the emotional dimension in, uh, produced by history in Polish-Ukrainian relations, uh, please remember that uh, our Lexington, that means the first battle of the independence, is called Zelenice and is situated in Ukraine. And our uh, Gettysburg, uh, the main uh, battle of the civil war, uh, is called Berestechko and is situated in Ukraine. And our El Alamo is called Zadvirje and is in the suburbs of Lviv in Ukraine. Uh, our now I'm turning to the Hungarian history. Our Eger uh, is called Kamilic Podolski and is in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, of course, we can uh, produce the entire set of the examples like that. What I'm trying to say is the fact that uh, since uh, the Kingdom of Poland, uh, while uh, being united with the great Duchy of Lithuania, that uh, in fact was Eastern Slavic state dominated by the ancestor of today's Belarusians uh, with the uh, strong Lithuanian component, but we can compare it to the Kingdom of England with the Wales uh, dynasty of Tudors, which uh, doesn't make uh, England Welsh. So in that sense, uh, when uh, the great Duchy of Lithuania liberated, in fact, from the Mongols, uh, the territory of today's uh, Ukraine and united with the Kingdom of Poland uh, in order uh, to uh, create a common defense against the Catholic Teutonic order uh, in uh, what then was Eastern Prussia. That produced a very complicated political phenomenon at the end after 200 years, uh, namely the uh, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, that had one demos, one political nation, uh, namely nobility, 
uh, we lack the word in Polish, but fortunately we can use the British analogy. Uh, please remember that uh, Scotsman speaking English is not English, but it doesn't prevent him from being British. Now, so in that sense, uh, that combination uh, in the 16th, 17th century created the political demos, uh, the nobility, because that was uh, Polish Ukrainian Commonwealth was <coughs> the uh, electoral, electoral monarchy. That means monarchy. That means uh, republican monarchy or monarchistic republic, uh, if you wish, uh, with the citizens that uh, had the full citizen political rights. Uh, about 10% of population, so please mind the fact that, for example, Britain and France achieved that percentage of uh, full political rights uh, in 19th century. Uh, in uh, Polish Ukrainian Commonwealth, it was since 1505. Uh, and uh, this uh, supra ethnic uh, political demos uh, then, uh, after the collapse of the Republic, was divided uh, into ethnic demoses, that means Polish, Ukrainian, Belarusian, Lithuanian, uh, Latvian. Uh, still the memory about that uh, exists, at least in Poland. It's rising in Ukraine and Lithuania. Uh, it's rising in Belarus quite rapidly. About 40% of the population, according to the latest poll, uh, perceive themselves as the heirs to the great Dutch of Lithuania and not the Russian Empire. Uh, this is uh, the symbol of being European and not uh, Eastern despotry. <clears throat> so that memory is important. Uh, another important fact about history is that uh, due to complicated historical process, uh, the uh, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth was not able to uh, deal with the, in fact, feudal problem of uh, the Cossacks, who were neither nobility nor the peasants, and uh, didn't fit to the political system of the country. Uh, that finally produced the rebellion, the Great Rebellion in 1648. Uh, then it provoked Russian uh, interference in the civil war in the Commonwealth, and in 1654, Russian troops for the first time entered Kyiv, 1654. It never, earlier, it had never began, uh, belonged uh, to Russia. Uh, next year, Russian troops took Vilnius, and in uh, 1655, uh, Swedish troops took Warsaw. Uh, and since that time, since mid 17th century, since the split between, between Poland and Ukraine, each Polish generation saw foreign troops in Poland till 1993. So, uh, when the Soviet troops were evacuated from uh, Polish soil. Yeah. So, uh, I'm speaking about that in order to show you uh, the interdependence uh, between uh, Polish Ukrainian cooperation and the general condition of both nations. Uh, if we cooperate, uh, we are prosperous. If we uh, are quarreling, there is the common disaster in the entire entire region. Please remember that Poland fought 18 wars against Russia. All the wars that were fought in an alliance with Ukraine, we won. All we fought without Ukraine, we lost. So the conclusion is again quite simple. Uh, and uh, the fact that Russia conquered Kyiv in 1654, uh, is the turning point in our history, in the Central European history. Since that time, Russian Empire was growing and Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth was uh, declining. Uh, and that is a common knowledge in Poland, in fact. Yeah, that the, the uh, key to the, come to the fate of the entire region uh, is in Ukraine. Uh, for modern times, uh, well, the title of the lecture is whether it's the uh, temporary alliance or uh, much more profound idea. So to answer it, uh, I have to uh, mention another important um, piece of Polish political thought. In 1905, during Russian-Japanese war, uh, the future leader of uh, Poland uh, that uh, ruled the country between the wars Józef Piłsudski, Marshal Józef Piłsudski, visited Tokyo and <coughs> produced a special memorandum to the Japanese government.
experiment uh, in which he, for the first time, uh, formulated the idea that Russian empire should be divided according to the national borders, ethnic borders, which of course means Ukraine, because that is the largest nation, non-Russian nation, except for the Poles, of course. At that time, Poland, as you know, was partitioned between, between <coughs> Austro-Hungary, uh, German Empire, and Russian Empire. Mm, nevertheless, uh, the two largest uh, ethnic and, in fact, as well, political nations uh, in the Russian Empire, except for Russians, were Poles and Ukrainians. Uh, so uh, to divide Russian Empire meant, in first of all, uh, to get the independence for Ukraine. Uh, Polish political thought between the wars uh, realized that uh, we cannot survive uh, as an independent country between the United Russian Empire, whatever is the political color of the empire, whether it's red or white or pink or yellow or green, who cares, and the uh, United, United uh, German Reich, especially the first Weimar Republic, then the Third Reich. Uh, Germany is, uh, from the ethnic point of view, uh, a homogeneous country. You cannot divide Germany back. Uh, there is no way back to the uh, pre-Napoleonic times when you have 300 uh, German states, uh, or even after the Congress of Vienna when you have uh, 34. Uh, uh, so uh, the conclusion is that um, having the ethnic border with Germany, we uh, have to have to have the political border with Germany. Uh, to move it a little bit in that direction or that direction cannot change the nature of the balance of power between powerful Germany and medium-sized Poland, while Poland at that time, I mean, between the wars, had no political, had no uh, ethnic border with Russia. There was no Kaliningrad region, so our ethnic borders were with Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine. And we are more than happy having no political border with Russia. Uh, so uh, the main political thoughts, uh, called in Polish tradition the Promethean one, from the ancient Greek Promethe uh, hero. Uh, Promethean idea uh, was based on the political plan to uh, help to all the non-Russian nations of Russian Empire if they want to uh, get independence. Uh, this is the source of Polish support uh, for Georgia, for Azerbaijan, uh, not to speak about Baltic states or Belarus or Ukraine, especially as those uh, closer geographically close, closer nations uh, share uh, several hundred of history with Poland between uh, 1385 uh, and, uh, in fact, 1863. Because uh, what I would like to stress is the fact that uh, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth was the largest community of free people in the world uh, till the uh, creation of the United States. Uh, so it survived uh, the partitions. I mean, the political nation, the demos, the citizens. That, of, uh, that was not just the community of the subject of the same king. No. Uh, just to show you the difference, when one of our political thinkers, uh, Maurizio Mochnatsky, uh, wrote uh, the critic essay about the French Revolution, he wrote one symbolic sentence. To abolish nobility? What a crazy idea you should nobilitate everybody. That shows you the uh, deep, deep difference between the uh, political structure and, uh, and culture of the two countries. In some sense, it was similar to Switzerland, in that sense that the citizens' rights roots were in the military service for the country, who defends the country, who protects the country, is a citizen and has the political rights. So when the state collapsed, that community of citizens survived. And the last war of the first Commonwealth was in, 16, in 1863, that means 68 years after the collapse of the state. And only after that, the political nation was divided into modern ethnic nations, uh, including Ukrainians. And uh, what I have said about the interwar uh, history, uh, this is uh, still remembered, I mean, Polish-Ukrainian alliance of 1920, 
the common um, military expedition to liberate Kiev from Bolsheviks. Uh, the heroic resistance of Ukrainian army uh, as the brothers in arm uh, in that war. Uh, and the uh, common perception of uh, Polish and to the larger and larger extent, because it's the ongoing process since John Paul II mentioned that in, uh, during his visit to Ukraine, that Ukraine was a defensor of, defensor of uh, Europe in the previous uh, centuries. Uh, that is a part of Polish culture. I mean, Poland has a self-image as ante murale christianitatis, uh, which means this uh, defensive wall of Christian Europe against uh, non-European invaders. And Ukraine share that uh, role, and especially today, uh, during the war against the uh, barbarian Russia. I, I dare to say that the present war uh, revived in Poland all the stereotypes about Russia. If you uh, stereotypes in a good sense of the word, if you ask me what will be the next war fought by Russia, if you uh, asked me that question two years ago, uh, I would have felt uneasy to give you such a stereotype answer. While what really happened uh, acknowledged all police stereotypes. I mean, Russian army is um, uh, cruel, no respect for the uh, lives of Russian soldiers, no respect for uh, civilians, is corrupted, yeah, everything is stolen, so there is a great shortage of everything, fuel, munition, uh, weapon. Uh, there is uh, the uh, over-centralization uh, and political uh, directives that are given to the uh, commanders in the battlefield uh, is the obstacle in the uh, effective military uh, operations and so on. Uh, that's something quite obvious. All Polish Russians wars look like that. Nothing surprised. When you see uh, the death corps of the victims of Russian massacre in uh, Irkiv, uh, and the death corpses of Polish officers from Katyn with their hands tied behind uh, their backs. You can hardly distinguish whether it's 1940 on, or 2022. It was the same. Uh, so we are not surprised. Uh, and now, uh, living history uh, aside, uh, I will turn to the present situation. What, uh, with all that historical emotional burden, uh, uh, what the present situation looks like from the Polish point of view. Well, so first of all, uh, we never believe uh, that uh, Russia uh, resigned from uh, its imperialistic uh, ambitions. Uh, Russia has a very good uh, propaganda uh, that is targeted quite well. That means the uh, message is shaped uh, according to the audience that uh, is expected to be addressed by a given piece of propaganda. Uh, I will show you this uh, on the example of the uh, Russian propaganda addressed to Germany, because it's uh, quite easy. I mean, Russia lost the uh, Cold War in the way in which Germany lost the First World War, namely in very unconvincing way. Uh, the army has never been defeated. No foreign troops were on uh, German or Russian soil. Minorities uh, abroad, uh, and that uh, tempting uh, convention that if they try again, uh, they can win. And that uh, the result, the outcome of the Cold War or the First World War was not the result of the uh, overwhelming superiority of the potential of the enemies but uh, just an accident caused by treason. Uh, if we try again without treason, we can win. Uh, having no democratic traditions at all, uh, at all. We can speculate about the short period between the, the February Revolution in Russia in 1917 and Bolshevik coup d'etat, but it was in fact rather the state of anarchy and not functioning democracy. So, 
in that sense there is no democratic tradition in Russia, maybe except some uh, merchant republics of Novgorod, Veliki, uh, and uh, Pskov that could be compared to the northern Italian cities or the Hanseatic cities, it's even better, uh, better, better analogy. But it's completely forgotten. So in, in Georgia, in uh, Abkhazia, and uh, so on, Ossetia. Uh, we saw the attempt to uh, inspire a quarrel between Poland and Lithuania over Polish minority uh, around the uh, Vilnius region uh, with a strong Russian interference in the uh, problems that really exist, yeah, but uh, we should mind the proportions. Uh, we uh, observed uh, all Russian propaganda about the alleged Ukrainian uh, uh, state as uh, Nazi state, uh, that is this uh, Russian uh, message directed to Central Europeans uh, due to tragic history of the Second World War in the region. Nevertheless, uh, the uh, Russian invasion of Georgia and then of Ukraine and Crimea uh, woke up uh, at least a part of Polish political class. Uh, and finally, uh, after 2014-2015, the first step was the uh, meeting of the uh, leaders of the Eastern flank of NATO in Bucharest in 2015, and the so called V9 was created. That means a lobbying group within NATO uh, composed of Baltic states, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria. And then we uh, proposed uh, to the entire alliance next year in 2016 when we had the uh, NATO summit in Warsaw uh, the creation of the system of deterrence of Russia uh, based on uh, enhanced forward presence. Please remember that Poland joined NATO in 1999, but in political sense, we had no uh, real military, st military structures on our soil. Uh, and uh, what I would like to stress, uh, we are, I dare to say, we are extremely realistic in that sense that we know that we uh, have to deal with our alliance, uh, allies and partners who are all democratic countries. It's not Europe of 18th century when you have the alliance between the kings, the kings give the orders and the uh, nations obey. It doesn't work like that. Uh, so of course we would like to have a massive military presence of our allies in the eastern flank of NATO. Uh, but uh, we know that in order to spend the resources in a strategic scale, uh, you need to win the support of your uh, citizens, uh, because these are the resources that are produced by them. And so uh, without that consent, that common consent, uh, you can only conduct wishful thinking policy. Uh, so in that sense, the first step was to create a limited uh, system based on the uh, deterrence by punishment uh, combined with the uh, enhanced forward presence, which, which in fact was uh, a pattern copied from the system that existed during the Cold War in Western Berlin, uh, when you had uh, American, British, and French garrison uh, that from pure military point of view uh, would have been smashed by the Soviets and Eastern Germans if uh, the decision to invade the city uh, had been taken. Uh, but uh, from political point of view, to take the decision to open fire to Americans uh, has a different uh, political way than to open fire to Western um, West Berlin uh, policemen. And the same is with Estonian army versus uh, British army, because this is the uh, British contingent that uh, is the uh, framework nation in Estonia. Canadian army is framework uh, contingent in uh, Latvia, uh, where Polish army uh, has its own contingent too. Then we have Germans and Lithuanian, Americans in Poland, mm, and uh, first it was combined, it was called uh, enhanced tailored, sorry, tailored forward presence. That means there was multinational brigade in uh, Romania, but without 
the component of any leading league of great power. Uh, today it's changed, of course, after the full-scale invasion. Uh, Romania served in Poland, Poles served in Romania, and the uh, deep idea behind that system is uh, to uh, put the uh, burden of the political decision on uh, the shoulders of the Kremlin's decision makers that should have no uh, opportunity to ask the question uh, whether our allies uh, come here to support us, but they should answer themselves the question what the orders should be given to their own troops if they meet our allies uh, already in the spots. Yeah? In that sense, uh, that uh, created the system of political deterrence. Still, the full-scale invasion uh, of February 24th added the question mark to that quite logical system. Because please remember that uh, the decisions are taken not on the base of reality, but on the base of the image of reality in the minds of the decision makers. And uh, uh, what uh, Ukrainian, Russian war in Ukraine uh, teaches us that Russian decision makers are able to take completely irrational decisions. Uh, why uh, a lot of experts said, well, it's just uh, a bluff, yeah, it's not possible. Uh, this entire uh, tension building measures around Ukraine in, the, um, in 2021, uh, it's just a political theater, uh, no uh, serious. Uh, decision maker can take the decision to invade Ukraine. Sorry. That was logic, but not true. Why? First, please remember that uh, Russian decision makers, well, first, Russia is a mafia state. Uh, Russian foreign policy is not conducted according to Russian national interest. Not at all. And that is the main mistake uh, made by our Western partners that perceived Russia as the state like all the others. Yeah. Now, please remember that uh, in the struggle for the power in Kremlin, Russian political class dissolved Russian empire twice in the 20th century. Once in 1918 in Brest and second time in Viscovi in the Forest in 1991. Why? In order to size the power at Kremlin in order to get rid of Gorbachev, you have to dissolve the Soviet Union. So it was done. Uh, so uh, the leading, uh, the engine of the uh, Russian policy is to size the power and to keep it. Because it's a very risky business to be a retired Russian leader. I mean, uh, the most probably ends is uh, to be hit. So uh, this is an existential uh, threat for any Russian leader, and it's uh, far less risky to lose the lives of the soldiers than uh, your own one. Uh, and in that sense, it, it, that is the group of Sioviks at Kremlin, uh, Putin is the symbol of the group, uh, that uh, leads the country. And uh, due to the fact that uh, the uh, prosperous years, the first decade of that century, are over, due to the uh, hygiene, Ukrainians committed, from the Russian point of view, unforgivable crime. They elected the president. Freely. They just vote and change the president. And they change 75% of the members of parliament. That's incredible. How they died in Russian meal, uh, in Russian war. According to Russian imperial propaganda, Ukrainians are, from the mental point of view, in fact, Russians. So if Ukrainians can change the president and 75% of the members of parliament, the Russians can do the same. And what if they are successful, if the country is prosperous, if uh, after a few years an average Russian would see that the level of life in Ukraine is better than in Russia? That would be completely devastating. And this is the real source of war. Not Donbass, not Crimea, not the land. It's about the freedom in Ukraine. If the people that are presented to Russian public opinion by Russian government as the people of, in fact, the same language and the same culture, 
which is not true, yeah? but we are speaking about uh, Russian image of the situation. If these people could change the political authorities of the country just voting, just exercising normal democratic procedures, that means that the entire Russian propaganda that democracy of the uh, Western type, well, in Polish language it sounds bad because there is democracy full on it. We have, we have not other signs of uh, kinds of democracy. We still remember people's democracy, uh, that means communist regime in Poland, and any uh, additional descriptions about democracy of this in Poland is suspicious. But democracy is democracy. Uh, while in Russia you had that's Russian term, suzerain democracy, which means, in fact, Putin's dictatorship. If Ukrainians show that it is not necessary uh, the way you have to run the country, uh, and the uh, cultural uh, area uh, perceived as uh, homogeneous by Russians uh, can successfully exercise democratic procedures and uh, grow, uh, that would be devastating for the and it is the real source of the war. Uh, still, uh, the Russians thought that uh, Ukrainian national identity is weak. Namely, they believe in their own propaganda. Uh, this is why Russia started the war with 170,000 soldiers that were ordered to invade the country that had 200 soldiers in line and 400 thousand soldiers who were not just uh, conscripts trained in polygons. They were the veterans of Donbass operation. Please remember that the war started in 2014. After eight years of war, 400,000 of Ukrainian men uh, won the battlefield experience. And they could be easily and quickly mobilized and were not fresh soldiers, yeah, they were experienced soldiers. And Russia expected to have a success inviting the country of the territorial size larger than France, with a population about 30 and something million, nobody knows exactly how much because of the great immigration, uh, with an army uh, smaller than uh, the defensive one. Uh, the army that was deployed around the borders for more than a half year and asked, sorry for being now a little bit, uh, how to say, trivialist, yeah, but asked an average for uh, what was the main occupation of Russian soldiers during half of the year on the polygons around uh, Ukrainian borders in 2021. They drank. How they get their money? They sold the fuel. No one reported it to the commanders. Yeah. So the army then was given the order to march, and it appeared that there is no fuel. What a surprise, Russian army is corrupted. As I have said, that's obvious. Russian army is corrupted. The entire country is corrupted. Uh, so the result was that the army was defeated. And the, the turning point was the decision of Zionists to stay, not to escape. But what it taught us, Russian army took a mobile crematoria while it was entering Ukrainian territory in march order and not battle order. What does it mean? They didn't, they didn't expect heavy fightings. So what the crematoria were for? To exterminate Ukrainian elements. There is a special word in Russian, perfectly known by the Poles, Obeskovodnyenia. That means decaptization. We have experienced it since 1655, all the time. I mean, in order to conquer the country, you have to exterminate the elves. Uh, and uh, that was a clear demonstration to the Polish public opinion that any rumors that, well, the times have changed. It's not 1937. By the way, in 1937, due to the order of Yezhov, the chief of Soviet political police, 
119,000 Poles were shot. Polish minority in the Soviet Union, uh, both exterminators. Uh, it's not 1940, of course, Catholic. Yeah. No, it is. Yeah. Our uh, analysts uh, analyzed the logistic uh, nature of the uh, potential operation of the deportation of the Baltic uh, nations today if the uh, territory of Baltic states is occupied. Two or three weeks. They are small nations. One million two hundred thousand of Estonians, about two million of Latvians, uh, less than three millions of Lithuanians. You need a number of trains and two, three weeks to deport everybody. And Russia is deporting Ukrainian citizens. And Russia is stealing children, just like Nazi Germany in Poland during the Second World War. And like Russian authorities in 1831, after the November uprising in Poland, where the orphans of the Polish officers were taken to the cadet officers' schools in Russia to be Russified and to serve the empire. Nothing new. And that, of course, creates a strong military security in the region. That means that deterrence by, the, by uh, punishment is not enough, because we cannot afford temporary occupation of any part of our territory by the Russian army, because we are not interested in the liberation of basic graves of our compatriots. And that is an obvious result of Russian occupation. So the political goal of Polish government of today is to turn from forward presence to forward defense, and from deterrence by punishment into deterrence by denial. And this is why we are uh, boosting our uh, military capacities Poland is buying a lot of equipment, <coughs> heavy equipment, and that heavy equipment that we have given to Ukraine, again, it's based on a very hard Polish uh, historical memory. Please remember that we are aware of the fact that there was no scale of armaments large enough that could be uh, made by France and Britain between September 1939 and May 1940 that would compensate the um, destruction of Polish army. Why I'm talking about that? Because there is no uh, such a large number of uh, Polish heavy equipment in Polish stores uh, that would wait for the worst scenario that would compensate the uh, destruction of Ukrainian army that equipment in the hands of Ukrainian soldiers is uh, destroying Russian military potential. I'm sorry for being so brutal, but we are perfectly aware that any Russian soldier killed in Ukraine never invade Poland, invades Poland. And any Russian tank or helicopter or uh, jet uh, shot or destroyed in Ukraine will never be used against Poland. That's my nice. that uh, and uh, due to the fact the Polish support for Ukraine uh, on the governmental level uh, is full and on the citizens level that's another large story uh, it's nice to hear that the world is impressed by the hospitality, hospitality of Poles uh, that welcomes Ukrainian refugees in our homes we have no uh, refugee camps in Poland. Uh, uh, well, about 12 million of Ukrainians crossed the border, but of course, some of them many times. Uh, so, an estimated number of Ukrainians in Poland is about 3 million. Both the refugees and the uh, economic integration from before the uh, state invasion. And there are no incidents, there are no protests, just the opposite. Why? Sorry for being maybe a little bit emotional, but my grandmother and my baby father at the time survived Warsaw Uprising. I was born and I live in Łódź because Warsaw was bombed, 80% of buildings were destroyed. My grandfather was killed and my orphaned small father and widow grandmother had nowhere to come back. Why am I talking about that? Because it's not an exceptional story in Poland. 
just remember that Poland lost more than six million of uh, citizens during the Second World War, uh, killed. Uh, and uh, each family suffered, which means that when we saw Ukrainian women and Ukrainian children as refugees, we see our grandmothers and our baby parents fed. You cannot uh, refrain from help. It's quite natural. It's like Bolton's phenomenon is that 300,000 young Ukrainian men cross the border in other direction. They join the army to defend the country. This is uh, respectful. Uh, I have mentioned the uh, kind of common culture in Switzerland. Yeah. Uh, the nobility, the citizens, are those who defend the country. Uh, so now Ukrainians are the nobles. They take the weapon in their hands and protect the entire region. There is no, well, we are all aware of the fact that Russia uh, produced a memorandum to NATO and to the United States on December 17th, 2021, demanding a zone of influence, and Poland is in the zone of influence. Baltic states are. Denmark is, and Bogenhol uh, was demanded to be uh, without American troops. So Russia has the ambitions uh, to uh, tell the others uh, how they should use or not use their own territory in the entire region. Unless Harry Ukrainian uh, resistance, uh, we are fully aware that uh, and it's the war of one of the nations of the former Commonwealth against the common enemy. For the first time since 300 years, Ukraine is on our side, fully, not a small group like in 1920. Uh, in uh, July uh, 2021, uh, our ministers of foreign affairs, Polish, Lithuanian, and Ukrainian, uh, signed a common declaration on the common political and cultural heritage of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth and the heritage of the military resistance against Russian imperialism in the 19th century. Please remember, Poland had 13 uprisings in its history, majority against Russia. By the way, the first one started in Ukraine, in Baal. Uh, so, uh, this is, is so uh, interconnected, uh, so intertwined, uh, that you can hardly uh, divide it. Uh, and this military component, this uh, knight ethos, uh, the men of the souls who are defending the country uh, against the barbarians. And this is the main image of Russian Poland in stages. Uh, that is a very stable uh, fundament for the future uh, cooperation. Uh, and uh, I know the time is almost over. We need some time for uh, discussion. Uh, just one sentence about uh, economy and uh, infrastructure. In 2015, Poland started the project of uh, my 3 c initiative. Shortly speaking, please never believe in the alleged anti-European character of that initiative. Uh, just the opposite is the implementation of the single European Act uh, that is translated into tangible material infrastructure reality and not just a pure political declaration. In order to have common market, you need infrastructure. And Ukraine is not a part of the project, but <coughs> In a large, to a large extent, it could be. It has a special status since last summit. And there is a lot of pressure and practical steps to combine the economies of the two countries. Uh, just before the full-scale invasion, five main Ukrainian airports were realized. Uh, we had the uh, important task to uh, change the size of the uh, railways, that is, the Russian railways are a little bit wider than the European ones, so we have to change it in Ukraine to European uh, size. Uh, we had uh, a privileged legal position because due to the fact that Polish Parliament uh, have, uh, has granted all the citizens' rights to Ukrainian refugees except for political rights. So uh, social 
assistance, medical services, and so on. The Ukrainian parliament did the same for the Polish citizens, which means that, uh, of course, now it's just a political gesture, and it's uh, the symbol. But after the war, uh, please mind the fact that the companies owned by Polish citizens will be privileged in Ukraine. And that will be treated as the companies uh, owned by uh, Ukrainian citizens. Uh, there is no, uh, in fact, uh, linguistic barrier. After two or three weeks, we can start communicating about them, uh, our respective languages. Uh, and uh, I think there's a huge potential uh, for cooperation and the hard conviction that uh, Russian threat is a stable one, it will not disappear, and nobody else in the region, except for the Poles and the Ukrainians, have potential large enough to create the construction strong enough to resist it. All the others are welcome, but are small. In order to show you the scale of Poland, please remember that in 2004, European Union was enlarged to 38 millions of Poles and 36 millions of the citizens of all the other nine states that joined the Union together with Poland. It's not to stress the scale of Poland, because the last remark. When we built our Commonwealth in 14th century, we invited the great Duke of Lithuania to be the King of Poland, and we didn't impose Polish monarch on the Lithuanian throne. I would like to say we understand that smaller partners must be fully respected unless we want to show the set history of uh, other unions from Kalmar one in Scandinavia to Yugoslavia one uh, in the 20th century. Uh, we cannot afford that. <coughs> Full respect for all the States in the region is the uh, condition sine qua non for success. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Please take a seat. Thank you, some water. No? no? Okay. You are tough. So, um, without further um, you know, delay, I would just like to open the floor for discussion or remarks or questions. So. Uh, in case you uh, want to uh, pose a question or, or uh, say a few words, please just raise your hand and uh, we will give a microphone to you. So, uh, are there any um, brave people uh, here? So, <laughs> to start. Okay, here we go. My name is Juan Pugaz, I'm the director of the Public Works Division at Warsaw. Uh, uh, thank you for your lecture. Uh, my question is very simple. From time to time we hear about so-called northern Benelux between, between Lithuania, Poland and Ukraine. What's your comment on that concept? Thank you very much. Uh, well, we are under <coughs> here about the Ludwig Triangle, uh, that is the platform of the coordination of first foreign policies, then other policies, for example, the cultural one, economic one, and between Poland, Lithuania, and Ukraine. Uh, that started in 2020 uh, and uh, is based on the tradition of the uh, Union of Lupin of 1569, and that created Commonwealth. Uh, the first Polish Lithuanian Union of 1385 was against the Teutonic Order, but the second one was against Moscow. And it means Russian imperialism forced uh, Great Duchy of Lithuania to seek for the support of the Kingdom of Poland. Uh, so uh, this is rather the platform of cooperation, and uh, well, uh, of course, there are a lot of sentiments in this, uh, in this uh, positive sentiments in these uh, uh, circles. Uh, but I think it would be premature to uh, speak about uh, something more concrete because uh, we cannot afford being unrealistic. And the first challenge is a military one. And uh, we just need the military protection. That is our lesson since 1717. If you want to reform the country, 
you have the military power to protect the informants unless you want to provoke Russian intervention. Uh, it's all the time on the same. Uh, since 1717, the same challenge. Uh, so uh, instead of um, inventing a nice sounding uh, sentimental construction, uh, we need a strong defense of uh, the uh, NATO Eastern Front Line. Uh, we would like to change the name Eastern Front because we are not in the front. We are on the front now. Uh, and Poland has the largest army in the region, uh, among NATO uh, states. It will be even larger. Ukraine has the largest in the region, the most experienced. And both armies are equipped with uh, American uh, weapons. Uh, the country in the regions are interested as well in uh, getting rid for good Russian gas and it could be replaced to the large extent by American LNG, by Norwegian gas, uh, and by uh, the gas from all over the world, uh, exploiting the uh, fact that uh, the LNG technology uh, made the gas market much more flexible than it used to be 20 years ago, and the maritime surprises uh, just uh, allowed us to get rid of the uh, links with Russia. So these are the very practical uh, dimensions of cooperation uh, that could lead, of course, to the deeper and deeper cooperation, uh, especially, well, now, I don't know whether I should say it openly, but I will use such a, an analogy. In 19th century, after the uh, Napoleonic Wars, please remember that Napoleon in Poland is a hero because he fought Russians, 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 and Austrians. Who cares what, who he did in Spain? It's the Spanish problem. Yeah. Uh, while uh, somebody who, uh, well, he didn't invade Russia, he liberated the Great Duchy of Lithuania. And that is the Polish perspective of the war of uh, 1812. And why talking about that? Uh, because then, for uh, the entire next century, the Poles perceived France as the greatest ally and greatest hope that they will come again here and liberate us and uh, create the just order in this part of Europe. Saying that, I'm going to say, well, we are happy having other powers, not the regional ones, not uh, the countries that are in the same region, uh, engaged in our region. But we are aware that uh, it not necessary is forever. And so that's the time. Uh, no one knows how long. 10 years, 100 years, who knows? But that's the time given to us, to the Poles, to Ukrainians, to Lithuanians, to Belarusians, to Latvians, Estonians. Uh, we are positively surprised by our Czech neighbors who cooperate in a very good way with us. Uh, for Romanians, for the Scandinavian countries. And Scandinavia is extremely important because uh, Scandinavian countries have uh, the same perception of the nature of Russian threats. They have no illusion. They have excellent state apparatus. Their officials are uh, skillful, uh, are uh, placed in uh, important places in international structures, in the Union, in NATO. And, uh, and uh, when we uh, told to our Western partners, look, Russians are like that, we uh, were confronted with the answer, oh, you the Poles and the Bulls, you are Russophobic due to your historical experience. While when the uh, Nordic countries say the same, they were uh, listened to. Uh, so it's a very important partner. There's a very good memory in Poland for the technical military cooperation and military industries between the wars with Sweden, for example. Now we have such a cooperation with Norway as well, with Finland, uh, just to mention uh, our uh, armored uh, vehicles uh, based on Papia uh, construction. Uh, so uh, to create the uh, original cooperation of the countries uh, that are uh, threatened by Russians, uh, and that citizens of which are ready to pay the price for security, Please remember what I have already said. Yeah? We are not in the Europe of absolutistic monarchs. We need 
the support of our citizens to spend the resources of the countries in strategic and not in a cosmetic scale. Uh, so uh, we are not surprised and not uh, offended by the fact that the most remote uh, peoples are not that eager in spending their resources to solve our problems. Uh, but uh, to create this construction in a region in which, of course, historical uh, traditions uh, of the links between Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, and Belarus is very important. But again, being realistic, we have excellent traditions of relations with Hungary. Excellent. They are our twin brothers in politics for many ages. And look what is going now. And it's a sad story. Uh, it's completely against the entire tradition. Uh, and uh, against the deepest uh, emotions in Poland that always have been very pro So uh, tradition and emotion is important, but it's not enough. While uh, we have uh, a very good uh, tradition of cooperation, uh, in spite of all the uh, historical turmoils uh, at the turn of 20 and, uh, 19th and 20th century, uh, now the uh, Russian invasion explains to everybody what is reality and what is just the legend, the historical legend. And I'm optimistic about this regional cooperation, but uh, again, uh, please uh, mind reality and the potential of the partners is as it is, and uh, we don't want to create any competitive structures towards uh, NATO. NATO is the most important one, the only really existing one, uh, and uh, we would like to uh, strengthen our common regional impact on the general strategic NATO decisions and not uh, attempting to create anything instead of NATO. Justly said that we cannot be unrealistic because of the uh, situation, um, and um, there is strong anti-Russian sentiment in, here in Poland. But we also observe this um, quite substantial shift in the thinking about Russia among um, West Western countries. And how do you think? Is it a long-term shift? Because, as you mentioned, we can't be unrealistic, and for this sort of um, another period, difficult uh, politically and. Uh, for this, for the region, we need also allies in the long term, in the long run. Do you do you see this shift long term, or is it something we can't really rely on? Well, there is no simple answer because the answer, as far as the moral dimension of your question is concerned, is yes. I mean, the condemnation of Russian crimes, of Russian system. Uh, the fact that it is rather shameful to cooperate with the present Russian uh, government, uh, that is, in my opinion, a stable uh, situation in the West. But that not necessarily means that the uh, majority of the citizens is ready to pay the price uh, to stop Russia. I mean, to condemn it uh, in a verbal sense, of course but then to pay for that with the reduction of their standard of living, with paying more money for uh, military spendings, uh, with serving in the army, or spending lives of their soldiers, uh, that's a completely different uh, issue. Uh, I cannot give you a, a simple answer as to well due to the fact that uh, there is no one public opinion in the West. Yeah? Uh, you have the Netherlands that uh, are in the uh, coalition uh, of uh, jet giving to Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, you have Spain that, in spite of being far away from the region, had quite fresh uh, experience of Russian interference in the Catalonian separatism. And um, just put aside the, the party life here, yeah, because the political parties competing for voters, it's a separate uh, world by the uh, state services responsible for security of the country are quite so now. I, I'm talking about uh, Spanish uh, in this very positive way. Uh, 
on the other side, you have uh, ambitions of other nations. I mean, uh, there is the constant uh, characteristic of the French policy since the old times, that uh, image of the third uh, force between the United States and either Soviet Union, either Russia, either China, the uh, last trip of Macron uh, to Beijing uh, shows us the characteristic of that way of thinking. Uh, that is combined, of course, with the natural uh, attempt to be in the camp of winners. So if Ukraine win, and I believe it win, uh, there will be plenty of fathers of the victory. Uh, while uh, the victory of Ukraine means what it means, in fact. It means that Russian uh, ability to start next war must be broken, which means victory must be complete. Uh, not means that Moscow should be occupied and the uh, parade of victory in the Red Square, of course not. But uh, this Japanese scenario, I mean, the situation in which the Japanese victories of, of 1905 uh, without occupation of any Russian territory uh, provoked the uh, political uh, shock in the country and the First Revolution. Yeah. The system collapsed, uh, at least for a while. Uh, but uh, the final outcome of that would be the creation of the strong bloc of the uh, countries with the realistic approach to Russia, which means Poland, uh, Ukraine, Baltic states, probably Scandinavian states, and Romania, uh, oriented with, uh, on a close cooperation with the United States as the only superpower able to deter Russia with its prestige. Uh, and of course, that would mean the reduction uh, of the political position of the core EU countries. And uh, we are all aware of the fact. Yeah? It's nothing surprising, neither for us, neither for those countries. countries. Uh, the very idea of European strategic autonomy, at least in this French interpretation, in fact is uh, based on the assumption to reduce American presence in Europe. We would like to boost American presence in Europe. Uh, and Ukraine as, as well, and the Baltic states as well, and Romania as well. Uh, and uh, being victorious in, just, in that region, uh, we will do our best to attract that uh, presence. Uh, so, of course, uh, when we go into details, uh, there are a lot of practical issues to be decided. Uh, I usually start my lectures for the students with the observation that we should watch politics in a way in which we watch a movie and not a photo. So that could be the, the best answer for your question. I mean, uh, everything is very dynamic. Uh, the result of the war will shape the future construction uh, of Europe. Uh, the future position of uh, two largest countries in the region, that means Poland and uh, Ukraine. Uh, who knows what will happen in Belarus and when? Uh, will you put $10 for uh, the life of Lukashenko next week? Who knows? And no one knows what happened there. Uh, so uh, this uh, shows to us to what an extent the system is fragile and the potential for deep changes is great. And nothing is sure. Yeah? It could uh, be uh, prolonged for the future. Nobody knows how long. Nevertheless, I cannot imagine, for example, the Transnistria to survive Ukrainian victory. Another issue. Yeah? Moldavia, Romania, Ukraine, Transnistria. Uh, what about Georgia? Uh, look uh, what happened uh, in the, the relations in Caucasus. Yeah? When Russia started to be defeated. Uh, the position of Azerbaijan uh, is being boosted. Uh, Armenia is reduced. Uh, Turkey is uh, the power that, in fact, uh, forced Russia to open the corridors for grain. Uh, then we have the combination between Armenia and Iran. Very interesting. Uh, as well from the point of view of the American engagement and American interest in the region. Uh, another factor is Israel, you know, with Russian presence, Russian presence in Syria. Uh, what will be the future of that? Uh, too many issues to be examined and uh, 
too many scenarios to present them in a short time. So, uh, yes, what we are afraid of is that if there is a change of regime in Russia, our friends from the West will do what they ever do. They say, oh, that new Russian leader is a real democrat. He is a pragmatic and reasonable, uh, responsible leader. Let's support them because all the others are worse. Uh, and we will have to convince them that no, reality is different. Mm, any other questions? I think we have uh, time for one more, uh, perhaps, and then we will Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> right from the start of the war, we had we, we, the, it was seen that most countries were uh, either siding on one side or the other side, even the, in the UN, in the voting and all that. Recently, the, the new uh, research and uh, findings that there is a shift in the perception by member states of different countries uh, in opinion. So opinion is changing, some of them are, those that were more aligned to the West are aligning now towards Russia, or those that were aligned towards Russia are aligning towards the other side. Uh, but be more specific from the African continent, uh, I didn't hear you mention anything about the African continent. Uh, what's your take, why do you think that uh, most African states that we've seen, or some African states, um, are not coming out firmly against this war, or against uh, one of the sides, or be found on the sides. And uh, we are seeing a trend that uh, is not the one that was there uh, in, in February 2022. It's, it's, it's changing, and uh, I think we need to analyze why this, this trend uh, from that part of the continent uh, happening. Well, I think that in, uh, in this uh, uh, context, the answer is uh, surprisingly simple because Africa is far away and the overwhelming majority of African people have no uh, direct experience with Russia, uh, while uh, they have the experience with the European colonial powers. Uh, and. Uh, Russia, surprisingly, but even in the 19th century, uh, tried to present itself as the uh, defender of uh, the uh, weaker peoples against European imperialism. Uh, at that time, it was Panslavism, which of course is completely unknown in Africa, I guess. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Russia, that was a very brutal colonial power inside the empire, was a revolutionary liberator outside the empire. And the main victim was the Ottoman Empire. I <laughs> think Russia was trying to uh, portray its expansion as the wars for liberation. Then the same did the Soviet Union. Uh, so except for some countries that suffered from communism uh, sponsored by Moscow, uh, like Ethiopia or uh, Angola or Mozambique, uh, I think that the others, especially in the situation in which the social problems are real, and the areas of poverty are large and painful. Uh, this image, I come back to the uh, nature of Russia, uh, Russian propaganda, which is targeted perfectly to the audience. When you speak to the European conservatives, you portray Putin as the crusader in the shining armor, uh, defending Europe uh, from uh, Islamic threat. When you speak to uh, leftist people, you portray uh, Putin as the heir of the uh, Soviet Union and the homeland of the proletarians of the world and the communist ideas. Uh, so it depends to whom you speak. Uh, and while speaking to the Ukrainian, uh, to the uh, African countries, uh, this image of uh, the heir of uh, the Soviet Union, the heir of alleged anti-colonial power. I would like to stress the fact alleged because, for example, Kivan Buhara was conquered by the Soviets and uh, just completing Russian colonial expansion in Central Asia, in Central Asia uh, and so on. But uh, having no knowledge about the reality in the Soviet Union, 
the, the propaganda is quite uh, successful, uh, while the old and well-known uh, imperial traditions of the European powers uh, could be easily portrayed uh, as uh, the ones that are uh, applied to poor Russia, that is a, a, a victim, a subject of that Western imperialism, and is forced to uh, defend uh, its own territory, because who knows in Africa that uh, Kyiv is as much Russian as Rome is French. Uh, I mean, uh, we can agree that uh, Rome uh, is the center of the, all the uh, post-Latin speaking nations, uh, French, Spaniards, Portuguese, uh, and Italians and Romanians, but that gives no uh, right to uh, the French uh, to say that uh, Rome should belong to France. While Russia is trying to create such a narrative that uh, since Kyiv is the beginning of the Eastern Slavic uh, civilization, so uh, it should belong to Moscow. Th that makes the same sense, yeah? because Russians are the largest nation among uh, Eastern Slavs, so the French are the largest among uh, post Roman nations, so what? Uh, uh, and uh, all those nuances can hardly be perceived by an average uh, African people, I guess. Uh, that's one uh, dimension. Another one, I think corruption. Russia is very corrupted, and overwhelming majority of African states are corrupted. And all those businesses uh, are intertwined. Uh, another ingredient, another factor, is Chinese penetration. Uh, and Russian military presence, especially in Mali, a Wagner group, uh, is present there. By the way, uh, the acknowledgement of the old Polish uh, diplomacy thesis since the 30s of the 19th century, uh, Polish diplomats warned our Western partners that Russian imperialism is multivectoral and should be stopped everywhere when you meet. Uh, that was perfectly understood by the Brits at the time, that had the imperial uh, common frontier uh, with Russian Empire uh, in the north, from India to the Black Sea Strands. So I think this is the answer. And the, this old image of the uh, communist country promising equality and uh, economic uh, rise for extremely poor and rather ill-educated people uh, the lack of knowledge about reality in Russia uh, and uh, the uh, corruptive uh, impact of Russian uh, government on uh, local uh, governments in different African countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you very much, dear guests, for being here with us today. And uh, I suggest we continue our discussion uh, over there, over uh, Lots of wine and some snacks. So, thank you very much for your questions. Um, and um, yeah, hope to see you uh, soon uh, during our next uh, events of this um, um, of this um, series. So, thank you very much uh, to everyone. And uh, yeah, that's that's all.